All right. Now we're recording for those that are listening to this. Okay. So, um, so anyway, um, so all of these things need correction. So when, the, when, when it talks about the sin of Adam in chapter 5 and its universal effect, think about it in, in all of those terms, not just in terms of, oh, man sinned, and now, you know, he and God are having a little problem here. It's this very big thing. It's a very big, uh, big problem. And Messiah Yeshua, whoops, cancel that. Uh, so, so uh, all of these things need correction. And if you, we read through chapter five, Messiah Yeshua comes. That portion I just read for you in verses fifteen through nineteen, uh, that. Uh, it says, uh, the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for on the one hand the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation, but on the other hand the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Not only that, for if the transgression of the one through the, if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of the righteousness will reign in life through the one. Messiah Yeshua, right? So, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Now that's a you know that's a controversial statement there. Justification of life to all men. Am I saying then that uh, you know God is going to save the world, everybody in the world, no matter you know regardless of who they are? And the answer to that is of course no. But the availability of relationship with God exists now through coming to faith in Messiah Yeshua. And it is Messiah Yeshua who is going to universally lift the curse, all those curses that we talked about. It's not just this idea of, well, sin, you know, an individual's sin. Much more cosmic in context. Okay. So the objective then in, in the work of Messiah Yeshua is to create a new humanity th with whom God can have this relationship. It's a promise that he made not only to Israel, but to all people, right? We went over the Abrahamic covenant, and remember three, there are three provisos in the Abrahamic covenant. God is going to bless Abraham. God is going to bless Abraham's family. And God is going to bless all mankind through Abraham's family. These are the three promises that God made, and these are being re, re, um, these are being realized through God's people, and most especially through through Messiah Yeshua. Okay, so by the time we get to the end of chapter five, he's saying we are to be a new humanity, right? In verses 20 and 21, he says, The law came in so that transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through Messiah, righteousness to eternal life through Messiah Yeshua our Lord. So, grace is, uh, in other words, that grace is the way that God has made uh, for all mankind, both Jew, Jew and non Jew to enter into eternal life with him. So the question now becomes, okay, if we live, what, what he's established now is we're all sinners. Uh, Torah does not unsin us. It's by grace in, in God. So how then shall we live? This is the beginning of, verse, uh, of, of chapter 6. So we go into our notes for chapter 6, if you've got them. Paul introduces a, an issue, right? Uh, he's anticipating a question on the part of the people there. Saying, so what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So, oh, what do you think? 
What do you think about this verse? Why does he even ask this question? Anybody? No? Come on, sleepyheads, wake up. It's like uh, 1230. <laughs> Well, he's he's just made this whole point about how by by increasing sin, grace abounded all the more, and so now he's now he wants to know, you know, do, is that a good thing? You know, by sinning, are we somehow doing something so good because that causes more grace to come into the world? That that's actually a, a Catholic doctrine. Um, the mm. the idea that by our sins we cause grace to come into the world, and that's tied in with the confession system yeah it's it, you know uh, there's a there's a corollary here you'll note at the beginning uh at the, i think it's at the end of chapter five actually in which he says that the law came in so that transgression would increase uh but where sin increased grace abounded the more so that sin so the law in other words that the laws function if you will, was to demonstrate sin. And that is also a doctrine uh, for many. You know, that we, the, God gave us the Torah so that we would uh, know how wretched we really are. But we, we've had, we had a long discussion about that one, one week in which we talked about what the function of the Torah really is. I will say this, that one of its consequences is that sin is demonstrated to be sin. And Paul is using that clearly in his arguments here in the Book of Romans. No question about it. But I think it would be ridiculous to assume that, the, that God gave the Torah just to show everybody up. That's not why he gave the Torah. And we talked about three reasons why the Torah was given. Anybody remember the three reasons? Anybody take notes with me or kept your notes? <laughs> I'm going to even give you the page, page number if you have it. <laughs> if I can find it myself. Anybody? Okay. All right. I see I'm going to have to remind you all. So let me find it on my, in my notes. Okay. So let me ask you a question while I'm looking for this. What was the first, what were the first commandments after the giving of the Ten Commandments, okay? Anybody remember? Uh, and in fact, uh, you can look at uh, this week's, you know, uh, Torah portion because the covenant is being renewed in this Torah portion. So what's the first thing that uh, God re required the, the Israelites to do collectively? To build a Mishkan. Right. To build the Mishkan. So you see, the first, uh, the first reason the Torah was given was so that they could build the Mishkan. And why, would, why is the building of the Mishkan so important? This place of encounter with the Shekhinah, a place of um, encounter between the people and the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Because the Torah is about our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's a framework for a relationship, for our getting to know him and who he is. Mm -hmm. Right. Correct. So if you go to pages 13, 14, and 15, you'll get my three reasons. And so I'll read. Uh, First, Israel is to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Through Israel, God would be able to dwell among mankind. Moreover, Israel would mediate the relationship between God and all mankind. In order to do that, they would have to be a holy nation, maintaining holiness in the people, the priesthood especially, the land, and especially the Mishkan, which would allow God's presence to dwell in their midst. This is the very first reason for Torah. Okay? It's not to show up sin. It's to make sure that, there, that somehow there would be a place on earth that approximated the holiness of heaven so that God could dwell there. Okay? So that's, uh, that's reason one. 
second reason is that the Torah would establish a standard whereby all humanity would be drawn to the light and image of God. Israel was to be that shining city on the hill for all people to be drawn to. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 2, it says, Now it will come about in, the, in that day, in the last day, the, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the Lord will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Right? We can sing songs uh, about that stuff. So that's the second, that was the second reason for it, uh, for Torah. Third, um, let's see, what's my third? What's my third reason? That's there somewhere. Okay, thirdly, the Torah was given that it might be the vehicle of God's blessing to his people Israel. I give, uh, I give you as an example, Deuteronomy 28. You know, if you look at that's what that's where they go up to the mountain and they, and they announce all the blessings. And if you, now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nation. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Okay? So these are the three primary reasons why God gave the Torah. Unfortunately, it also has an effect. It shows that we are not capable of, of living up to the standard that God demanded. Sadly, sad to say, but it is. It is true. So Paul is using that here, but it is not the reason for Torah. Can we all agree on that? That it, that wasn't the reason Torah was given just to show us up? I mean, I think that's, a, a, you know, a bit ridiculous. Uh, and it's been insisted upon so that people will, be, antinomians insist upon it. You know, if the, if, because if the law is efficacious in any direction, then what do we need Yeshua for is their, is their logic. Well, let me just say this. In, of, of those three reasons, I did not say that by means of it you are quote unquote saved, whatever people think that means. Okay? It just means that the Torah was given for a particular purpose and it has this effect that it does show that we are sinful people and cannot, by our own efforts, maintain a relationship with God. If we can't do it, if God doesn't demonstrate grace toward us. We're lost. And, we, and listen, you know, what does it say in the Talmud? All Israel has a place in the world to come. Why? Because of our fathers. Because, God, because of God's grace to our fathers and the deal he made with them at Sinai, if you, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Okay? So there's no, none of this, uh, you know, well, if you, you have to obey all 613 commandments perfectly, otherwise, you know, you're screwed. I mean, by the way, a lot of the code has to do with God knowing that human beings were going to sin and he gave them a way to, for, you know, to have their sins forgiven. Did it, did he not read, read, read the book of Leviticus. If you're having a problem with that, you know, you sin. if you do this sin, here's how you're going to take care. You're going to go to the priest and blah, blah, blah. And okay, take care. So we can maintain that purity, that holiness as a nation. And God could continue to live in, in, in our midst. Okay. So right away, uh, so when we get back to chapter 6, verse 1 and following, um, let's continue because what's happening here is Paul is, them, is, is saying now, may it never be. Shall we say then are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? No, it never how shall we who died to sin still live in it? In other words, having been recipients of grace, a change of life should be the result. 
And so Paul, anticipating the question, says that since we have God's grace to rely on, why worry about how we live? You know, it's, it, this is the question that's coming up. If we have God's grace to rely on, why do we have to worry about how we live? And interestingly enough, I think that some groups, some, some Christian groups have taken this notion of, uh, of uh, relying on the grace of God to such an, extreme, such an extreme place that any kind of good works uh, are, are almost frowned upon. I mean, it's, it's quite ridiculous. You know, that nothing that we do, it, I've read some things this, just this week, you know, that in, a, in any good deed that's, that's done is almost like trash. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I don't believe that. You know, I, I actually think that people who don't know the Lord, they can do good things. That doesn't mean they're, you know, they're better than anybody, but, you know, I mean, they, they do, you know, I, I, would you agree with that? Or am I kidding myself with that? There are a lot of people who don't know the Messiah who do good things. And there are a lot of people who know Messiah who are a bunch of rats. That too. So this whole notion of how are we to live? Well, in other words, if we're to live by the Spirit, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Living in the grace of God, living by the Spirit. Do you have any idea what that means to you? It means that I have a will. I want to do things. But in prayer and worship and praise and thanksgiving, I seek what God wants me to do, not what I want to do. Okay. All right. Does anybody know uh, the reference to the new covenant in, uh, in Hebrew scriptures from Jeremiah? Somebody look it up. It's Jeremiah chapter 31. I've got it right here. Why don't you read it? Um, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant in the house of Israel and in the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. All right, there you go. So, what, so in other words, that the Spirit works with something. You know, in other words, it just, it does, what's going to happen to us doesn't come out of just the indwelling of the spirit. He says, I will write my law on your heart. So what's going, so what's going to happen then? Is the law to be abandoned? Is, is God, the, 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 the precept and principle of God's law to be, uh, you know, washed away and all that's going to happen is uh, somehow, you know, we're just going to do the right thing because we, because, because, <laughs> Or are we going to know the right thing? Which is it, do you think? Yeah. Well, as a, as a, Go ahead, Shamini. Okay. <laughs> I was going to just say, won't, won't they both align, though? Right, like the the written law and the law of the spirit of Christ in us, they should be in agreement. Okay, well, I th that's right. I mean, let, let me explain. Um, you know, I'll explain it this way. In um, in Judaism, uh, there's a, um, a a concept known as devachut. Any of you ever heard of Devachut? The Devachut is the, uh, you know, if I were translating it into New Testament lingo, it would be walking in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? So Devachut is 
uh, what it really means is God consciousness. Yeah. Okay. And uh, this is the highest achievement in spiritual Jewish life to achieve Devachut. Okay. And the way, uh, uh, the way, uh, observant people who are serious about this kind of thing achieve this is through the practice of mitzvot. You know, there are, there are any number of spiritual practices they will use. Prayer is one of them. Torah study is another. Uh, observing various mitzvot. Um, all of this to ingrain all of that in their very in their very soul, right? In order to that it becomes their way of being, their way of being. You understand? Yeah. So in the same way, you know. Now that's hard work. That take that takes a lifetime. And what I believe that God is promising us in Jeremiah is that he's going to, he's going to take that the raw material of the, of of his word and implant it in our hearts and we'll know it and be able to live it out. Okay? Well, isn't that also partially the indwelling of, of, of the Ruach? You know, I, I remember when I first came to faith, all of a sudden, when I started doing things wrong, you know, it, it, it felt like Jiminy Cricket sitting on my shoulder warning me that I was gonna be doing something wrong. And for me, the you know, the, 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 the thing is to practice hearing God's voice. He's implanted this stuff on our heart, but you got to be paying attention and you got to be listening for it. Otherwise, life just goes too fast and you can just overlook what God's trying to tell you. Well, all of that, that's true, but you're speaking, you know, in other words, you're, you're, what you're saying is listening to the Spirit and yielding to the Spirit of God in our lives. Right. And to a certain extent, that will work because we've already talked about this at the beginning uh, when we talked about natural law when Paul was, um, you know, uh, describing the Gentile world, that there is a there is something in the human conscience that uh, is embedded. Uh, we uh, we sear our consciences so that we can we can do all kinds of evil things, but when we become sensitized to it you know, uh, well, then we respond more appropriately. Um, but this goes a bit, this goes further. In other words, that God has, a, has created a standard for us in the mitzvot, in, this, in the Torah, that we will be enabled to live up to by means of the Holy Spirit. This is the new humanity that God is creating, that writing the law on our heart is what he promised. So that means that we will know it. No one will have to teach us. He says in that, I think in that same area, I don't know if it's him or Ezekiel. He says, in that day, no one will have to teach his brother because we will all know. Well, how are we going to know? What is it? Osmosis? We're going to get, you know, you know, we're going to get an injection and, or are we actually going to understand, study, know the word of God and be able, enabled through the power of the spirit to apply it? the power of Messiah's faithfulness to apply it uh, more, you know, more con consistently in our lives. This is what I think he's saying. Paul is not, because he's going to go on to say, listen, he, he's, he, <clears throat> he says in verse three and following, he says, uh, this is chapter six again. Or do you not know? Or do you know? that all of us who have been baptized into Messiah Yeshua have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Messiah was raised from, dead, from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Or if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. 
So he's saying, so what he's telling us is that he's creating, you know, it's, I, I presume he, he sees it as more than mere analogy, but that something has happened when we enter into Messiah, that we participate in some, some way that is, uh, you know, eludes me to, to describe. We participate in his death, that he died to all of that. Remember something. Messiah Yeshua took on himself all the sin of the world. You know, there's actually, I wish I had, I wish I had the actual book with me at the moment, but there's a, there's a legend which comes out of some midrash, I don't know which one it is, uh, about how God created certain things at the beginning of, of the world, at the beginning of all things. And one of those was Messiah. And it goes on to talk about how that the Messiah uh, uh, would have to take on the sins of his, of his people. And would he do it? And God is uh, having a discussion with him about whether he would do it. And the Messiah says, I'll do it if uh, all of the people, all, every generation from beginning to end is, um, is, is, um, made clean, you know, is forgiven. And God says, uh, it will, it will be that way. And so the Messiah agrees to take on, uh, all of this sin. So what Messiah Yeshua did then was he took all of our sin upon himself. And on the, see, this is why, you know, when we think about Yeshua's suffering, uh, you know, and it was pretty bad if you just look at the descriptions in the Bible of what he went through. Even that is not, does not, it, it doesn't describe what he endured. Because you and I can never, we, we can, it can be described for us. Oh, how they beat him up with uh, whips and chains and whatever it was and how they put nails on his hands and his feet and hung him up on that piece of wood there and um, and he died, you know, and, you know, stuck a sword in his side and all of that. And all of that, we can almost imagine. But I don't think we have the capacity to imagine what it was like for him to bear all the sin of the world in himself. That's something that is incomprehensible to you and I as human beings. We only know how bad it is to bear our own sins. How much more so for to bear the sins of of of, of all people? I mean, I, it's just not. I can't. I can't do it. But I can say this: we, you know, Paul is describing that somehow we participated in that, and in the same way we participate then in his new life that he gets, the, the resurrected life that he now participates in. Remember something, Yeshua was resurrected. He died as a human being and was resurrected as a, as a human being. He was recognizable to his buddies. He looked like them, talked like them, and so on. So we now participate in that new life. So I'd like to know... He goes on to say, if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. But he who has died is free from sin. So now he's saying we are new creations in Messiah Yeshua. And here's the problem. Do we feel like new creations? Do we feel like life is different? Do we understand that our lives are not, do not have to be ruled by the old, our old ways? What do you think? Yes? No? No? I think it depends on, 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 the individual and their awareness. I mean, uh, I can, I can, I can speak for myself personally, having 
come to faith relatively recently that the feeling of uh, being a, 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 a new creation and a, a, a very clear separation between old life and new life uh, is very real and very specific and easily recountable even now. Uh, mm. But I think also, you know, there, there, there's a certain challenge uh, in, 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 in dwelling in a world that's constantly trying to strip that new identity from us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 it's easy to lose touch with that newness uh, uh, and lose touch with that awareness. Right. Uh, well, right. And imagine for those of us who've been in the faith for a much, much longer time, all of a sudden that distinction that we felt, you know, I, because I'm trying to remember, you know, my own moment of, uh, re, you know, coming to faith and how different everything seemed to feel at that moment. I don't know if it was just my emotions or whatever it was that was operating on me. But, you know, the real world imposes itself. Mm-hmm. You know, and as the real world continues to impose itself, we can sometimes get distracted. Uh, we we move away from the power that God has now instilled in us. Instead of developing that power, if I if I can do it, if I can say it that way, you know. And then real and sometimes reality strikes. Right, we get sick, you know, or we get uh, or we have problems at work, or we have problems with our relationships. Or, you know, who knows what else, you know, financial problems, whatever, you know, just the everyday of life. And it can seem like the, like this world and its powers are, are more powerful than the new life to which we've been called. This is why we have to be on guard constantly and we have to push forward into, our, into, the, into this relationship we have with Messiah Yeshua. The first is, awareness that Paul is trying to make us aware that hey we are new creatures we are new creations and we need to be able to uh, embrace the new life that God is calling us to and I can only imagine this uh, how interesting this must have been for Paul to have this discussion with the, the Gentiles in Rome because Roman life was such uh, so much different than the lives of the Jewish people. Their value systems were completely contrary to Jewish values in almost every dimension, whether it was business or sexual relationships or just you know simple ethics. Uh, in just in virtually every way. And so Paul is having to address these people. You know, you're no longer, you remember how he described, if you go back, you want to take a look, you can just take a look at the way he describes Gentile life in verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 18 and following. Looks more like a description of modern society than it does of uh, ancient Roman society. But, um, but, so now they're to be something completely, completely different. And imagine how that, you know, the, the contrast there. And, they're, and, and he's saying to them, in order for this to happen for you, you, you need to understand what, uh, your new reality. And the new reality is you have been born again. You know, I'm going to use that phrase, born again to a different kind of existence. And this is the one thing I think I wish believers could get, we could all get a, a grip on, that we live life at a different level. And that, the, you know, we're not just waiting for the eschaton to, be, to realize all of this. That this, is ha- this ha- should be happening for us in the here and now. And that we don't have to react to our circumstances the way we, you know, the way the world reacts. We have, uh, we have other you know, resources to call upon. So he says, listen, you've died to your old way of life, so now be born again to this new, uh, to this new life that should reflect the life of Messiah Yeshua. I have a comment. Yeah. Isn't, isn't, because you were talking before, like, isn't it a lot of 
uh, like spirit, soul, and body in the sense that your spirit is renewed. So you're changed in your spirit, but maybe your physical body, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking of my own experience of illness too, but you, maybe you are, if you're living in the flesh and through the physical, that's very different than if you're living through the spirit and you can be connected to living through the spirit and which is renewed and which is healthy and which is, you know, pure and all of those things, or you can choose to live by the flesh and in the physical realm more, you know what I mean? Like when we have always have a choice and that awareness of spirit, your renewed spirit in you Mm -hmm. through your soul helps your physical realm to actually be transformed over time. I don't know. Okay, so let's think about that. I mean, it's 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 good. You bring up an interesting point, and for me, it's not so much. I don't want to create a false dichotomy between our spirit and our flesh. You know. Um, okay. On the other hand, what we need to do is to recognize how it is that we react to circumstances in the world in which we uh, which which we live. We are both spiritual and physical beings. Right. And the, the, the fact is that we always have a choice on how to respond to whatever is going on around us, whether it, that means it's in our bodies or external to us. Mm-hmm. And see, here's what I would tell you, Shamini. You know, eternal life began the day you met the Messiah. And so whatever this life holds, it, we, we're going to do, we're going to, we, what we're going to try to do is to glorify God in the life that we have to the best that, best of, that we can, in, in the best way that we can. Mm-hmm. But you see, here's what I believe. I believe that human beings who don't know the Lord are motivated, have to be motivated by what's going on in this world. There is no world to come for them as far as they're concerned. So everything is about that. You know, I got to feel good. I got, you know, I got, I got to do, I got to have the most. I got to, you know, these are all of our motivations. Paul talks about that in the first, uh, in chapter one. These were your motivations. you greedy, self-motivated, you know, you know, you lovers of men rather than lovers of God and so on. They create a system, uh, and we've created a, a, you know, a system in this world that is based on judging how well we're doing by certain criteria. How well, how, how, how wealthy we are, how popular we are, how, you know, all these kinds of things, and our success is is measured that way, not by our relationship with God, which is the eternal thing. Mm-hmm. You know, whenever I, you know, you, you and I probably have talked about this before in terms of illness, that Paul had some kind of problem. He had some kind of physical ailment. And God refused to take it away from him uh, for whatever his reasons was. But Paul did not measure himself by that. You see, we don't measure ourselves by that. He said, I don't even listen, when I'm weak, I'm strong. You know, because I can count on God's power in my life. I'm going to do everything I planned to do. I'm going to walk right through because he could count on the spirit of God to do so. And that's, uh, this is the power that is in us in this new life that we have in Messiah Yeshua. We just have to take hold of it the best way we can and, uh, and, and, and power through it. You know, that, it's kind of like what I, how I feel. That we we have something to call on, and God will do. God will not let us down. I just believe it. That God will not let us down. He didn't let Paul down, and He's not going to let us down either. He's going to empower us to do what we're meant to be doing in this life. And what these folks are saying, you know, what Paul is anticipating here in this uh, thing is, um, well, let's read a little bit more. I guess that's the best thing we can do here. Uh, okay. Uh, 
Okay. Let me just read my notes here. So, so uh, yeah. Okay. So I, let me. <laughs> so let me explain what I what how I want I want to do this in terms of uh, I want I always try to do this in terms of uh, our understanding of God's covenant with Israel. So. We talked about some terminology uh, earlier, uh, in which uh, Paul uses terms like justification, grace, blessing, and curse. And so, in illustrating this, uh, I want to use the law covenant. So, think about this. You know, prior to the giving of of, of the law covenant at Sinai the children of Israel were chosen by a sovereign act of grace, right? This is, you can read this in Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 and six to 8. And in doing so, they were justified uh, by means of grace, okay? However, by accepting the Torah at Sinai, they entered into a covenant whereby, acting as, as his agents in this world, they would obey the terms of the covenant. Uh, the, so the third... Uh, the third of the ways that I talked to you about before, you remember I gave you three reasons, primary reasons for the Torah. The third of those was to mediate God's blessing to his people. So stated another way, within the relationship of grace, we have the choice to live in obedience to God's commands and thus live in his blessing or not resulting in destruction. So let's think about this in terms of what Paul is saying here in chapter six. So he said, so he says, should we sin so grace will abound? May it never be, right? Because, why? Why do you think that's not true? If, if it's not based on, uh, if our relationship with God is not based on our behavior, but rather simply on the grace of God, and God is a very gracious God and very forgiving, and Jesus, after all, died for everybody's sins for all time, why do we have to do anything? Why can't I just be a you know ravenous murderer and just do whatever I want to do and you know and and just say I you know, I plead the blood of Jesus, you know why can't I just do that or why shouldn't I just do that? It's foolish and negative consequences. Why? Wait a minute. I thought uh, I thought it was all about grace. No, just thought, in the physical world. Okay. You have to go to prison for the rest of your life. I, oh, I have to go to prison for the rest of my life, but I'll still go to heaven. So what do, do I do? What the heck? <laughs> go for it. <laughs> okay, so again, I want to compare it. I want you to think about this in terms of the, uh, the you know, God's covenant with Israel. So God, it's, so again, God chose the Jewish people as a sovereign act of his loving kindness. I, you know, for Abraham's sake, he chose, he chose Isaac, he chose uh, Jacob, he chose Jacob's sons and their descendants. How, and, he, uh, and so they were his people and would always be his people. And we, have the, and we have the record of the Hebrew scriptures, by the way, to demonstrate that, you know, the Jewish people were not always faithful. Nevertheless, God always, you know, always stayed in relationship with them. Even when he sent them into exile, when he, as he sent them into exile, he, he, he already had the plan for their restoration in mind. All you have to do is read the prophets. Isaiah condemns and condemns and condemns, and then he talks about their restoration, and so do all the other prophets. So God never abandons his people, ever no matter how unfaithful they are. But as you say, Shamani, there are consequences when you don't live according to God's will. There will be consequences. And it's the same thing in, the, in, in, in now, in Messiah Yeshua. Yes, we have the grace of God. We have the loving kindness of the Lord. But he gives us his commandments in order that we might live in blessing. And so it is necessary for us 
to understand what those things are and to try our very best, if we can, to live in them. You know, why, why would we want to live any other way if by doing the things that God says to do, we can expect blessing in our lives? So should grace, uh, should we sin so grace may abound? May it never be. We died to these things. And now we're to live in the grace, in the joy and blessing of God. Okay? So there's always this uh, understanding, because I, I happen to think Paul asked this question, not merely because his logical argument was saying, okay, well, uh, you, know, he pre you know, he presumed the question, but also because these people were, their lives were turning back to that old way because they came to this understanding of what they thought grace was. The grace was a get out of jail free card. And I fear that in, in, even in, mod, in modern context, people who are believers in Messiah Yeshua often think this way in certain communities. I think this is the way people think that, hey, it's okay uh, to, to have, uh, you know, to do evil things and all this other stuff. And then maybe they don't even think it's evil. I don't know. But they think it's okay because they have their get out of jail free card. You know, as long as I have that. Uh, you know, as long as I have that, I can, I don't have to worry about anything else. When in fact, if we want to live lives of blessing in God, we need to understand God's word and his will and do our best to fulfill it. And sometimes that can go against the, sometimes, most of the time it's going to go against the grain of the value system of this world. Nevertheless, we are to try our best to depend upon that. Okay? All right. Plus there's love, right? So if you love God, you're not going to, you know, whether you get a consequence or not, Love would motivate you to want to please God and do right. have work through you to, to love others. Well, you would so. think so. Right. Exactly. You would think so. So anyway, what is this uh, new way of life that uh, Paul calls being united with Messiah? Now, according to some people, it, it does not involve the Torah. So I'm going to give you this, this quotation, which comes from, uh, this is from, uh, a book called uh, A Rereading of Romans by a man named Stanley Stowers. He says this. He says, chapters 6 through 8 present the benefits of Christ as a way to the goal of Gentile obedience, but without a law-centered regimen of practices aimed at subduing the passions. Those who have reenacted Christ's death have simply died to bondage under passions and desires. Identification with Christ lifts God's sentence of Gentile slavery under the passions and desires. What do you, what's your reaction to that quotation? I realize you didn't read the whole chapter and don't have the whole context of what he's doing there, but do you have any reaction to that notion that it's a... Torah-free um, opportunity here for the Gentiles, right? It's uh, the benefits of Christ as a way to the goal of Gentile obedience, but without a law-centered regimen. So it's not, what do you think? Do you think that God's commands or standards are different now that Messiah Yeshua has come? In other words, what God thinks of as a good, a good person is different now than it was then? Yeah. Hmm? Then there's no standard for how you're supposed to live. It's just where you get to decide for yourself. Kelly, we're having a hard time hearing you in there. You're going to have to speak more directly into your phone. I'm sorry. I said, um, then there's no standard for living besides what people want to decide for themselves. 
if there's what he's saying, if there's there you can do that we could just live any want, we're justified by just that. There's no Torah, there's no standard, there's no right and wrong. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So in other words, you know, uh, by what measure will we measure the goodness of uh, this new life that these Gentile people that Paul is talking to are to be called? Based on what? On what set of values? You know, some people call it the law of Christ. What is that? Can anybody define the law of Christ to me? For me? Well, God is the same. You asked that before, right? It's still the same God. He doesn't change. It's maybe the way he's relating to us changes now through Jesus. It's different. It's a different covenant. Okay. So, so how are we to know whether we're, we're, we're living up to this new standard, this new life in Messiah? How would you do it? How do you do it? Well, you said before, it's written in our hearts, so staying connected to... Is it? What? What's written there? And also the word. I would even work that out. Well, Jesus, to me, that means Jesus lives in me. That's how I think of that. And Jesus is the word. So they're both good. They're both necessary. Okay. So what does that mean in terms of the outworking of it in your own life? Or in the outworking of it in anybody's life? What does it look like? Love. That's a nice word. I, I'm not sure how to define that. <laughs> I, I think, the, oh, go on. No. I think some of, some of it is what Meryl was talking about earlier uh, with Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder. Um, a combination of the idea that once you're saved and whatever that means, and I think I, I have a sense of what that means, but once you're saved, that's irrevocable. You can't go back on that. So you don't have to worry constantly, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? But just aspiring to do it better and do it better. And, and as other people were saying, staying in the word, learning more about God's character, learning more about what he wants from us, um, and I think the, the question then becomes, as I'm sure my husband is about to pitch in, um, <laughs> whether, the source, whether the source of that is Torah, whether the source of that is um, what Yeshua says in the Gospels or what the apostles say in the various epistles. Um, I think that winds up being the question is, is, is this from the law that's in our hearts? Is there more than just the, the traditional law that's written in our hearts? Um, so what, what is the standard? And I think that I think the standard probably comes as an amalgam of a number of these things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know that we ever can know whether we're all the way there, but I don't think that we're required to be all the way there. I think we're required to be seeking to be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um let's take let's that was a pretty good answer actually but um I'm, I'm thinking about the romans now for a moment and paul what paul is saying to them uh for them there were not all the things that are all those um resources you just listed were were, were pretty much not available to them you know and that um paul was relying on the Hebrew scriptures, for instance, to, to teach them the word of God, okay? And so what I, what I guess what I'm driving at is that uh, I don't think, you know, the, the scripture tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that his standards don't change, who he is does not change, what he expects from his people does not change. So in terms of uh, how we are to live with one another and the kinds of things that God is expecting from us, he has already taught us in the, in, in the, in the scripture, in the Hebrew scripture. Now, 
I always go, I have this prince, I have this uh, saying that I use because in dealing with communities of Jews and non-Jews, um, we have, because of my own theology and the distinctions that I feel need to be drawn uh, uh, in terms of those relationships, I speak about the Torah in terms of precept and principle. So in other words, the precepts of Torah are for the Jewish people to follow. We, we, why? Because our ancestors agreed to it and we're bound by it. So the very precepts of Torah are ours to deal with. In other words, as an example, um, I'll use Shabbat. So Shabbat, it says, uh, the Shamru Bnei Yisrael. So it is, Israel shall guard, the word is Shamar, guard the Sabbath. We, we say observe, we translate it observe, but it, the word Shamar means to guard. We're the guardians of Shabbat. So we have a special, and God says it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. So it's a sign. Uh, we have this, in other words, the Jewish people have a special relationship to the Shabbat. That is our responsibility. So that's the precept of Shabbat. However, having said that, the principle of Shabbat is applicable to all people. I know this because Shabbat was first instituted at the beginning of creation, not after the Jewish people got hold of it. You know, so it, it's a principle. And so whatever God is driving at with us in Shabbat, taking, resting, focusing ourselves on him, focusing on the world to come, these are all things for all human beings, right? So in the same way, the other aspects of Torah have principles and precept, uh, precepts and principles in, in them. And so this is how I think, and this is what I believe Paul taught whenever he taught people, because, you know, eventually Paul's going to get off the theology, starting in verse, in chapter 12, and he's going to start talking about practical application of all that nonsense that he just talked about for 11 chapters. And this is what it's going to look like. And he does, the, and he does this in every single letter that he ever wrote. You know, he spends the first half of the letter giving you all this deep theology that everybody, you know, that uh, every scholar has now poured over for 2,000 years and never been able to figure out. And then he talks about the practical applications of it for the people he's discussing these things with. He says, now, he'll always say, therefore, or now, as, or as a result of all of this, here, this is what, what kind of people should we be? Here, let's talk about that. And so it's the same way here. I, you know, in, in the, you know, there's a saying in Torah, in Talmud, it says, uh, because God loved Israel, he gave us many commandments. It was the love of God that gave us his word so that we would be able to follow it and be in relationship with him. So in the same way, this is, I believe, an operation of grace. And when grace abounds, it, it affirms the Torah. I think Paul's going to say that by the end of this chapter. But that it affirms of God to us so that we can live in the blessing which God provides in that word. I told you, the, the third portion, of the third purpose of Torah was so that God could mediate his blessing to his people. If you do this, everything's going to work out for you. If you do this, you'll, you'll see this result in your life. And this is what I think Paul is trying to drive home to these people about grace. You know, is that a raised hand there, or I am? I don't know. I, I, I thought I saw a hand up there. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I uh, yeah, I hope the uh, you see where I'm going with this. Okay, this understanding of what God is doing in giving us grace. So let's see. Back to our scripture here. So. Verse 12, he says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. 
And do not, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not master you, shall not be master over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. So there again, he talks about this uh, new, new power that we have to live apart from. You don't have to surrender to your base, your, your darker angels. That we that what we want to do is to is to give ourselves over to the good in, that God has has presented to us, because we're no longer slaves. We've been set free by dying with Messiah Yeshua and being raised with Him. Now we can we 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 can uh, uh, live the, the the life of God within us. Of course, you got to know what that is so that you can do the right thing. But you have that. That's the power that we have. So there's an interesting discussion uh, that for some reason I included in my notes here. Um, uh, you know, it, when, when God created man in, um, maybe I'll share my screen. I, I don't know if you'll be able to see this. Let me see if I can share my screen here so you can see this thing. So give me a second here. So can you see these notes here? Can you guys see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the, the uh, this is the line I want us to take a look at. So this is a this is a Genesis two seven in Hebrew. Vayser uh, Adonai Elohim et haAdam afar min haAdama. So what it says is that God created man out of the dust of the earth. You know, basically what it says. But this word for created or formed, actually is the word for formed, is vayatsar or yatsar, all right? And now here's the interesting thing about this. This is the only way this word is spelled in the whole Hebrew Bible. You see how it's spelled? It's vav, yod, yod, tzare, resh. It has two yods in it, right? So the rabbis, of course, asked the question, why are there two yods in this spelling of Vayetzer here, but nowhere else in the whole Bible? There's got to be a reason. And what they decided that was that because God was created with this twofold, these twofold attributes, which we call Yetzer Haya, Yetzer HaTov, and Yetzer Hara. How many of you have ever heard of this before? Uh, Yetzer Hara, Yetzer HaTov. The, the evil Yetzer and the and the good, you know, the good inclination and the evil inclination. So, uh, what, he, what Paul is saying is that in Messiah, we've been empowered by the Spirit to overcome the, the Yetzirah. And Paul's encouraging us not to yield to this inclination. We don't have to. We are no longer bound by it. It is no longer the dominant force in our lives. And we can, then, and we can overcome this. So I, I just want to read you this little portion down here where I've just highlighted. This is from the Birchat HaShachar in the morning prayers. And this is what we pray every morning. So it says, let not the evil inclination dominate us, attach us to the good inclination and to good deeds and compel our evil inclination to be subservient to you. Grant us today grace, kindness, and mercy in your eyes. So this is a Jewish prayer that is said every morning in the Birchat HaShachar. To, uh, in the hope that we can overcome our evil inclination, okay? And so let's, let me just ask all of you who are believers in Messiah Yeshua, do you have no in evil inclinations ever? Are you utterly free of evil inclination? So I get my utterly, car. Huh? 
I said till I get in my car. Till you get in your car. <laughs> That's the only place, huh? <laughs> well, that's not what I'm saying. Right. So, so, so here's the point, you know, and my point is, is that uh, it's still, a, a, there's an opportunity at every moment, and we're, we're compelled to make a decision all the time about how we're going to react to the circumstances that surround us. Are we going to give in to the evil inclination, or are we not? So again, in Jewish devotional life, how do we overcome the evil yetzer? We overcome the evil yetzer by knowing the will of God. By knowing it and practicing it deliberately. You know, this is one of the, this is one of the um, purposes of Musar, for instance. In Musar, where we're trying to develop good traits, you know, what do we do? There's a very intentional um, doing of things. Like if you're impatient, then you practice patience. If you're a worry wart, you practice not worrying. I mean, you know, I mean, it's sort of like that kind of thing where you actually uh, work on it. You see, and and I think the same thing is true of the of life in Messiah Yeshua. You know, we're not going to be. Uh, you know, we can't just magic, you know, just magically call on things. We develop those things by practicing the life of Messiah Yeshua in our own lives. That means knowing what that life is like, you knowing how, you know, his goodness and how he treated others. And we treat others the same way he did. And um, uh, when people, what when is, when does he say? When, you know, someone strikes you on the cheek, uh, cheek turn the other one to them. That's a hard one. But, uh, you know, doing that, you want a really good summation of it all, go to uh, Leviticus chapter 19. Read through the, the Leviticus chapter 19. It's a wonderful chapter on uh, what, the, what the righteous life is, how to treat people well. Uh, and then it, which is summed up with the phrase, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It tells you how to love your neighbor as yourself first, and then it sums it up with that statement. So if you ever want to do a little exercise, read Leviticus 19. Okay, so I'm really trying. Didn't, Rabbi, didn't the... Uh... Sorry, go ahead. What happened? Did I lose somebody? Um, Yeshua, uh, answered, Yeshua answered the... Uh, person who said what's the greatest commandment along the lines of what you just got through saying you said to love god love your neighbor and the torah and the prophets hang on these two on this command. correct correct so what is he telling the young man do the things that are in torah and you'll do the right thing he sums that up and you know gives a summary of them but his expectation is that this is a person who would know what god's word has to say I mean, this is why we study the Word of God, so we know what it says, and we know how to react in certain circumstances, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. If we're going to decide, if we decide we're going to emulate Yeshua, don't you think we need to know what, who he was, and what, you know, how he did things, how he went about his life, right? Probably be a good idea. Yes, and it, it's, love is not a word. A love is what you do. Well, that's precisely so what, Yeshua what you was do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see if we can finish up this paragraph, this uh, this chapter, so we can get into the madness of chapter seven. So let me read verses fifteen and following here. It says, "What then shall we, shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be." Do you not know when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. 
But just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. When you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you were you deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For well, the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. Okay. So he concludes by saying, now that we have a changed mind, we should be enjoying a new reality. Uh, we should no longer be acting in accordance with our old way of thinking. That it's no longer our existential reality, so it makes no sense and cannot lead to a life, to life, um, to continue to live by old paradigms of right and wrong. So this is the thing. We have to live by a new paradigm, by a new, by a new uh, zeitgeist. <laughs> you know, uh, just a new way of looking at the world. And uh, if we're still pursuing the old goals, then we're going to find ourselves frustrated by the, by. Uh, you know, with our lives. So, you know, what I think Paul was calling, you know, I think it's it's even more radical. Sometimes when I think about it, uh, how much more radical life was for um, for these Romans, particularly the, the Gentile Romans, living in a, a, a in a world where. Every, almost all their values were directly opposite the biblical values. And these folks were never exposed to it at all. See, one of the things that, that is different for you and me uh, versus these, these Romans and their experience is that you and I, we all grew up in Western Judeo-Christian culture, right? So at least a measure of this uh, of right and wrong is uh, corresponds to the kinds of lives we want to live now, even though we want to do it at a higher level. Okay? For the ancient Romans, right and wrong uh, compared to the Jews was almost completely opposite. Completely opposite. So it's a, it, I think we're in a little more trouble because sometimes I think we think that, you know, there are a lot of things that are good about our culture and, and right about our society and all this other stuff. So I don't need to make any adjustments because after all, you know, it's okay. So, but I think what, what we, uh, the, the trap that we can, we wind up falling into is we set, we substitute what seems good for God's best. You know, that, okay, every, I'm, I'm a pretty decent human being. I'm doing it pretty well. I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm okay doing it the way I'm doing it. And we think that, the, that okay is okay. Rather than pushing forward, pressing forward to God's best. And what I would hope for you and for me and for everybody that we, we, we consider, continue to pursue the God's best for us. Not just what we think is okay and good. If we can do that, then we're gonna, I think we'll see things that we never dreamed of for ourselves and for our families and for our community. So I really want to, that's what I think Paul was calling these folks to in this life in, in chapter six. And he's telling us that the way to it 
is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not devoid of the word of God, as if the Holy Spirit is going to just, you know, magically make all good, you know, goodness pour out of us without any, you know, I mean, the Holy Spirit works with me. And we're going to discover this in chapter seven, because we're going to talk about, when we talked about chapter seven next week, it's going to be three laws and three principles that are operational. So there are three parts of this. But God works with me, his word, and with the spirit. And those three things together comprise what my life is going to be like. Okay? So what we want to do is to know the word of God and be willing to yield to the Holy Spirit. And if we can do those three things, if we can do those things, we can realize the resurrection life of Messiah Yeshua in us right now. And with that, we'll conclude. And uh, so are there any questions? Uh, any Anything else we can clarify for you? Why well, have all of you here? We have nothing to do this afternoon except plow the driveway. <laughs> so everything was perfectly clear then. <laughs> Is that, is that what I am to assume? <laughs> All right. It has, to per, it has to percolate, yeah. It has to percolate, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that's fine. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll continue on to Chapter 7 next week. I don't know if I sent those notes out yet. I think I'll, I don't think I did, but I'll get them out during the week. And because uh, Paul's going to confuse us even further in chapter seven. <laughs> so. do, you, uh, do you think, you know, I mean, this is a, you know, this, 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 like you talk about how, you know, the theology of the first half of Romans is so confusing and, and you can read commentaries from all different kinds of perspectives, picking it apart and taking different interpretations and uh, uh, do you think that this was as confusing uh, uh, for, 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 for these communities in, in, in Rome who were reading this at the time when they received this letter? Uh, um, uh, uh, and, 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 and what's your perspective on that? Yeah. The answer is yes. I think they were totally confused. Uh, he was just as confusing then as he is now. Uh, even Peter admits to this in, in one of his letters where he says, the, you know, Paul, the sayings of Paul are very hard to understand. So even his own contemporaries, if we believe that Peter wrote those letters, you know, um, you know, had, had some difficulties uh, with comprehending, getting their head around everything that Paul was saying. He was a very complicated person, and he, and he had a problem, and that was, uh, it, uh, I think it's a problem. And the problem is, is that he never said with one word what he could say with a thousand. And, uh, and because of that, he just, he just cl clouded the clouded issues, mm -hmm. and I, you know? And so I think there was a lot of confusion back then. I think there was a lot of confusion in the early, with the early church fathers. There's a lot of confusion with the early reformers and there's a lot of confusion today. And that's why they're, uh, Paul probably has a, more books written about him than anybody except maybe Jesus himself. Um, and people are still trying to figure him out and trying to understand precisely the kinds of things that he was saying. Uh, you know, what I don't think is, is as confusing as some of the deeper uh, details of his, of his theology were his purposes, what he was trying to accomplish in saying what he was saying, which was, uh, in general, to get people to rely on God, God and God's Holy Spirit, and to love one another in spite of the fact that they were not going to agree about everything. Because that's, and that's particularly true in the, in the letter to the Romans. He knows that these people are not going to agree about everything when he gets through with this thing. But he wants them to, 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 to rise above that, to grab onto those things which they have in common, and to love each other, as a, uh, you know, despite the differences. To tolerate the differences that, that are, are not essential, 
and to um, get along with each other, help each other out. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I, I think that was, you know, and that's been the problem with Paul and why I, you know, frankly, it's taken me 30 years before I ever did a study on the letter to the Romans because it's, it's so confusing uh, because he's saying so many different things. You know, he's trying to give them a comprehensive view of his theology. Remember what he, he said in, uh, it was in chapter one, uh, in chapter one, he, uh, let's see, it's easier to do it this way. In chapter one of Romans, he said, um, uh, I think it's verse five. He said, through, uh, you know, uh, here's my job. I have received grace and an apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for his name's sake. And how did, and to do that, he had to help them to understand their relationship to the Jewish people, if they were going to understand that in appropriate context. And that's really, it was really difficult when already in Rome, for instance, they were thinking, what, what, what do we need the Jews for? We don't need them. We were living without them for years, and now they're coming back, and what, what do we need them for? And the, the same thing is true of the body of Messiah today. What do we need the Jews for? You know, they've been gone for 2,000 years. We don't need them now. When, in fact, you know, the relationship between Israel and the church is the key to, um, is the key to final redemption, frankly. So it's all very confusing. <laughs> you know, and you have 2,000 years of interpret, interpret, uh, interpretive history behind it. It's even more confusing. <laughs> So, um, long answer, just, just like Paul would give a long answer when I could have just said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else before we go? No? Okay. All right, gang. So, uh, hopefully, we'll get together next week under better circumstances. And uh, although these weren't bad, <laughs> although now I have to figure out what I'm going to do with the driveway. Uh, okay, so uh, let's start a word of prayer, and uh, I'll see everybody soon, I hope. So, Lord, we uh, we want to just bless you and thank you for the grace that you have, that is available through our Messiah, Yeshua. Now, Lord, may we live in that grace, and by the power of that grace, live lives that uh, are, uh, that uh, produce Kedush Hashem, uh, the sanctification of your name, wherever we go. And, Lord, that we should be an example of uh, the power of the Spirit in the lives of God's people. And that, it's, that in and of itself will draw all men to Messiah Yeshua. So, Lord, uh, thank you for him and for his uh, willingness to do what was necessary to make your grace available to all of us. We pray, Yeshem and Yeshua. Amen. Thank Shabbat you. Shalom, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Shabbos. Thank you, Rabbi. Well, so, Miriam and uh, those Dowerman people, you got we got to get together. I would yes, like sir. that. We've got to figure that out. So let's. Uh, I'll give you a call this week. Maybe we can figure out a time. We maybe Meryl and I can get down there if it's you know you guys are a little busy or something. That'd be so nice. Okay. That'd be really really yeah, nice. We really miss you guys. So you take care, Shamini. Be well, sweetheart. Take care. We'll see everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye bye.